thank you for joining CivilNet. Today we'll be speaking with Dr. Armen Mazmanian about the legitimacy of the war, what's going on in Karabakh. Uh, I know it's difficult to speak about any legitimacy when it comes to war, but here are some issues that need to be discussed. Uh, thank you, Dr. Masmania, for joining us. And uh, my first question is that from the beginning of Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, two sides, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh and Azerbaijan, have been talking about two different principles, both of which seem to have considerable weight and backing in the international political arena. Karabakh is pushing forward the right of the people for self-determination and Azerbaijan is talking about the territorial integrity. So how do these two principles weigh uh, as far as legitimacy go? Thank you, Rubini, for, for hosting me here. Thank you for having me here. Uh, it's a good question. But first, uh, I would like to analyze that question in a broader context of uh, how international law deals with situations like Karabakh. Uh, of course, formally we have these two uh, concepts of international law conflicting. By the way, these are not two principles. One of them is a principle, the territorial integrity. The other one is a right to self-determination. So we, here we have, on one hand, a rational construct that is there to prevent uh, into, uh, threats to international security. On the other hand, we have a right. It's a normative concept. It's a value that the international community is there to support. But uh, again, taking this broader view on how these two uh, concepts deal with the issue, we need to first of all understand that we shouldn't take any formalistic view of how the international law regulates the conflict. First of all, the public perception of international law is quite formalistic, I should say, in our perception. See, for example, Azerbaijan always claims that the territorial integrity is the principle that should prevail, that is an important principle that should be uh, taking precedence, etc. On the other hand, we also hear a lot of uh, comments from the other side that uh, uh, self-governance or self-determination the, is the important or the prevailing factor that should be taken into consideration. Actually, the international law, if we take formalistically, it does not have a formula for addressing issues like this. And if we take the developments into international relations, into international law in the latest decade or two, we can see some conflict resolved under one principle while the, in the other conflict we saw the and that self determination prevailing relatively arbitrary like uh, what is at the base of one conflict being resolved on one principle and the other on the other well let, let, let's not use the word arbitrary in some cases we may have feelings that the resolutions of conflicts have been arbitrary this is the perception for example of the international community at large towards how the conflict in Crimea was resolved, for example. But again, this is more an exception. I would rather say that uh, it's not about arbitrariness, but what we are missing essentially here is the, the concept of legitimacy. And if we refer to, uh, for example, Kosovo, we could see that uh, the self-determination there pre prevailed, and we saw international recognition uh, not unilateral, but by a majority of Western countries, for example, recognition of Kosovo, basically based on the conviction that uh, uh, independence of uh, this formerly Yugoslav, uh, part of Serbia's formerly Yugoslav Republic, is uh, intended at uh, securing the security or, or uh, promoting the security of the region. And uh, essentially, we can see that uh, there was also an argument that uh, uh, Serbia or Yugoslavia at the moment were, in a way, missing the legitimate claim over this uh, region. I, I'm, I'm not backing these uh, claims anyway, but this was, in essence, in the heart of the arguments of the Western community, which backed for uh, Kosovo's security. Well, in the so how would this translate to the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict? It translates in a very, very direct way. 
we should now look at the recent developments and the recent fighting in Karlbach and reflect and reconsider new perspectives of how the claims on both parties are legitimate. Again, legitimacy lies in the heart of international legal resolution also, or le international legal perspectives of this conflict. And here, uh, looking at uh, the issues of legitimacy and concentrating on the recent developments, why don't we take these three main arguments that I can propose or suggest that the international community also, among others, should pay a very important attention to. What we have seen in the last couple of days is a heavy fighting, but we have seen use of weapons of mass destruction. Right now we will hear reports about more and more uh, destructive weapons being used. Have your artillery coming out every day? In the in the conflict zone, and we have seen uh, reports that uh, weapons such as smerch, the Russian-made smerch is being used. That is a weapon, first of all, forbidden for use against civilians, and we have seen that these weapons are, are being used by Azerbaijan exactly against civilian populations. We see the shelling of not only the front line, we see shellings of the villages and settlements and the towns. We have seen a direct threat, an official threat of shelling of the capital city of Nagorno-Karabakh. What are these uh, incidents talking about? We have seen also brutal murders of civilians uh, by uh, Azeri forces. We have seen these disturbing uh, photos by head of uh, elderly Karimba. people who yes, have And also left. news of beheadings that has reached so these are, these are reports that remind some chronics from uh, ISIS uh, actions. And so these are very these, disturbing. Uh, these, this information, is, if proven, which I don't think is going to be a problem to do so, will take away from the legitimacy of the Azerbaijani claim? Is well, that absolutely. what we're talking about? You can see uh, this evidence proves that Azerbaijani claims is essentially over the territory, not the, the population of Karabakh, which delegitimizes totally the claim from the perspective of international That's law. the bottom line. It's uh, like their attack is against the population, not for the territory. And then uh, you can understand how legitimate is the counterclaim of the Karabakh and Armenia that uh, the claim of Azerbaijan over the territory uh, essentially means ethnic cleansing, essentially means Karabakh, if, in the ter if within Azerbaijan, then it's Karabakh without the Armenian population, which used to be over 70% of Karabakh's population before the conflict started in the 90, 90s, end of 90s, but now we know that. So with the so same logic, if we try to understand the nagorno karabakh claim of self-determination, what gives it weight and what takes away from its legitimacy? Well, absolutely it means that nagorno karabakhs fight is an exist fight for it, its existential claim, it's for, for its survival. It's a claim against uh, brutal ethnic, uh, the perspective of brutal ethnic cleansing, and it's a claim against I didn't finish, by the way. Why, why don't I go back to my second point, why, why this uh, entire uh, recent developments delegitimize Azerbaijan's claims against the territory of Nagorno-Karabakh. We have also witnessed the militant national rhetoric by official Baku and official Azerbaijan, uh, not about the conflict itself, but against the Armenians as a race, we can recall uh, Safarov case. Uh, I think everyone knows, yes. but I may remind the case of uh, an Armenian citizen being beheaded, actually, again, brutally murdered by an Azeri citizen. And during a Not in Karabakh, not in a war zone. It, it, it was in Europe during a seminar, and the person has been beheaded at night while sleeping. Again, this incident itself, from a human point of view, is uh, simply... Well, probably we need to look more, so, not so much into the incident itself, because it can be separated, what I'm saying, yes. Because it wouldn't be such a big sign of the militant Azeri rhetoric towards Armenians, or 
hatred, the rhetoric of hatred, if not the uh, following developments of this story After when return. the person has been extradited to Azerbaijan and has, has been granted a title of national hero personally by the president of Azerbaijan. Simply this story speaks of the fact that uh, national hatred against Armenians, this racist rhetoric is an official Azeri But this is a good policy. example. Sorry, I'm interrupting you again. Uh, but why did the international law interfere in Safarov's case? Why was he allowed to return to, to Azerbaijan? Why was there no action against what happened? So this, this, is this a failure of international law? Rubini, in many, case, in many respects, it's a failure of international law. But again, we shouldn't look at this law as a formal law. As, as written rules that regulate these things, we should more concentrate on the failure of the international community to properly or sufficiently condemn these actions. I remember there have been a lot of statements condemning this, but there hasn't been sufficiently strong reaction and action which would consequently prevent this nationalist and racist rhetoric in Europe, in the territory of countries which are part of the Council of Europe. And this is what right now should the message to the international community be. This recent developments are another sign that the uh, Azeri policy towards Karabakh, towards Armenia is nothing else than a res officially racist policy, officially, official policy of national hatred. I should be honest, Rubina, here in Armenia and I believe also in Karabakh, we also do not witness a policy of inter-ethnic harmony or calls for inter-ethnic harmony. This is quite unfortunate. But this is more or less a regional pattern. We see it in Georgia, we see it in Russia, we see it in Middle East. This is unfortunate. But if we compare it with uh, an official policy of racism in Azerbaijan, these are two quite incomparable things. At least in Armenia, you don't feel any strong racist sentiments against us, Aris. right? Two and days ago. if you do, it's probably in retaliation to, it's an echo. Honestly, I don't feel any hostility towards Azeri nation or race. Probably some against the Azeri state, which is actually fighting you, fighting your civilians in a way. Right, two days ago, I was in a conference in Armenia, here in Armenia, sitting around a table with Azeri scientists, Azeri political scientists that are here freely, we were communicating with them freely, they were here without any security, etc. Uh, I don't see that tension, I don't see that racism being so strong in Armenia, while we can see it's, it's uh, up in, at the level of national, national policy. In so this is something that can be held against the Armenian side, let's generalize and not say nagorno karabakh Armenian side. Uh, it cannot be held against the Armenian side as it can be held uh, against the, uh, Azerbaijan this in this case from an inter international perspective. This is Racism. directly delegitimizing Azerbaijan's claims over Nagorno-Karabakh. You cannot claim legitimacy over people against which you have this official policy of uh, Dr. Mazanian, discrimination and... Sorry to be interrupting you again. Just now we're talking about a ceasefire. It was announced about a couple of hours ago from this interview uh, from the international perspective and from the legitimacy of all the international bodies that are discussing the, the conflict and calling on ceasefire and uh, cessation of hostilities. Who has the right to impose a ceasefire on uh, Karabakh or Azerbaijan today internationally? Which, which body? I think no one has a right to impose ceasefire or cessation of hostilities. Officially, it might be the Security Council of the United Nations and any actions, any actions that uh, would be directed towards that might be only sanctioned by the uh, Security Council. We, but to be realistic, we should more speak about not the right, but the power or the, the real capacity to, to do that. And 
then we should recall the three most important uh, powers that are part of the Minsk group. These are Russia, first of all, France and the United States, who have the official uh, mandate to resolve or to help resolving this conflict. I, I wouldn't advocate for these powers to ever interfere in terms of using force, but this is especially probably an opportunity for the three of them and the larger international community to come together and find a compromise and uh, act unilaterally on behalf of the international community in order to prevent further escalation of the conflict and uh, to prevent further, further fighting and to prevent further humanitarian uh, catastrophes. Uh, Dr. Mazmanian, another question. Uh, we heard uh, President Ser Sarkisian say yesterday that if the situation escalates, Armenia will recognize the independence of Republic uh, of Karabakh. What does this internationally mean from the perspective of the law and perspective of what can Armenia continue doing for Karabakh or how things will change? Because from my limited perspective, that does not help the situation in any sense, does it? I think we should look at this from now on, uh, from the perspective of what I outlined in the beginning, from the perspective of legitimacy. Of course, Armenia has been quite cautiously and uh, quite prudently avoiding doing that, recognizing the independence of Nagorno-Karabakh for the sake of uh, uh, negotiations and for the sake of finding compromise. But you can see that uh, the time has gone since the ceasefire in, back in 1994 and uh, the negotiations has by and large proven uh, to, be useless. to be useless or fruitless. But on the other hand, we have seen that this time hasn't been used for to build uh, what I told you, the, a situation where the two ethnic groups could come together and again, I refer to Azerbaijan as militant rhetoric of national hatred. In this context, in this context, probably uh, the recognition of Karabakh should be viewed not only by the Armenia but by also the international community as the only remaining or necessitated way of securing the human rights of people there in Nagorno-Karabakh. Their right to live, their right to survive, their existential right to live in their home country, on their homeland. And again, in light of these uh, recent brutalities, in light of these recent uh, violations of all the norms of international humanitarian law, this uh, necessitated step probably gets even more legitimacy. Again, Armenia has been uh, hesitating doing this, and this has been a step towards uh, finding a compromise. But I think now the international community should be paying more attention to this only way of resolution, prospective way of resolution, if no other way works, if no negotiation works anymore. As, as the only way that, uh, as the case was in Kosovo. So wider spread, uh, wider spread recognition of the independence of Nagorno-Karabakh Republic might be a way of resolving the, well, the conflict in a way as to s send a clear message to Azerbaijan as to uh, hands off? I'm not advocating for that. Again, this should be a um, means of last resort. If, if negotiations prove broken, if we see that there is no any way for peaceful resolution of the conflict through negotiations, I just say that the international community should be already more open-minded to recognizing this as a last resort step if Armenia ever does this. Thank you very much, Dr. Mazmanian, and I hope this was informative for the viewers.